Hello, uh, my name is Tom Court. I'm a systems developer at the Vermont Department of Taxes. And today I'm going to give you a talk titled Starting a State Government Open Source Project. Um, and I have a quote uh, from uh, one of the Vermont statutes uh, about access to public records. Uh, it says, officers of governments are trustees and servants of the people. And it is in the public interest to enable a person to review and criticize their decisions, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment. Um, so really, government already has the spirit of open source, and um, you just need to sort of move forward and um, start releasing some code. And before I begin, I'm going to start with a few definitions, just so everyone's on the same page. Uh, a lot of people here are from different backgrounds. Uh, so what is open source software? These are the um, 10 points that um, the open source initiative came up with. Um, you can find them on opensource.org and it's software that you can freely redistribute and you can have access to the source code, that, the complete source code to build the program. You can create your own derivative works um, and integrity of the author's source code, that means um, you have to make known if you've changed something in someone's original work. Um, for example, um, if you take Firefox and you make changes to it, you can't call it Firefox. That's so if you introduce bugs, the Firefox people don't look bad. Uh, you can't discriminate against persons or groups. Um, you can't say only this type of person can use the software. Um, the license can't discriminate against fields of endeavor. Um, you can't have something that's officially open source and um, tell certain uh, fields of endeavor that they can't use it. Like you can't say the software can't be used in a nuclear facility or in an airplane. Um, the license has to be able to be redistributable so that people know their rights and have a copy of the license that they can read and review. Um, and the license can't be specific to a certain product. Um, you can't come out with XYZ application and make XYZ license. Otherwise, there would be hundreds and hundreds of licenses. And even with the current number of licenses, it's very confusing to sort of um, know all the licenses and know all the particular differences between them. Um, and the license can't restrict other software. And it must also be technology neutral. And when I talk about state government software, I mean software that you could potentially release to the public as open source. It's not encumbered by any patents or copyright claims. It's developed in-house by state agencies. Um, and it's not um, owned by anyone else. And um, it's paid for with tax money. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be um, giving an example. Um, it's called The Gateway. It's an actual project that the Vermont Department of Taxes released as open source software. We did that back in June. And it implements um, a thing called Streamlined Sales Tax. And um, basically, it's a project where multiple states are getting together, defining some standards, and are able to collect sales tax from other states. So if you buy something from mail order from another state, that business can collect taxes for Vermont and send us the money. And it provides a web interface along with the web services. The web interface lets people manage the system and um, sort of um, interact with it without having it to be an application to application interaction. We also have some client tools which let people transmit data to us and validate the transmissions that they're sending. Um, and we've designed it to be an extensible framework, um, and so we're going to be adding more taxes to it as time progresses. Uh, we're currently working on modernized e-file. It's a new standard for electronic filing that's going to be implemented in 2009. And our project website is at the bottom. It's gateway.sf.net. Where to begin? Um, when, you're, when you're 
thinking about starting open source and state government, you kind of want to start small. You don't want to one day wake up and say, let's release everything as open source, um, because that would be pretty <coughs> reckless. Um, you need developers that are on board with it. You need managers on board with it. And generally, to get everyone all on the same page, you need to start out small. And an example I like to use is IT infrastructure. Uh, when you're rolling out an ap application upgrade to all your users, you usually start with just one user. They test it. They say, that's great. And then you roll it out to your IT staff. They see if there are any problems with it. And then eventually, you roll it out to everybody. And so it's the gradual progression that um, is probably going to be the easiest if you're thinking about starting an open source project. And when you go out and pitch this to your management or to um, other people in state government, um, you have to understand that not everybody has heard of open source software and um, how you go about it. Um, it'll be their first impression of open source software. And so you have to um, be very careful in how you frame things. Um, and when you're starting a, an open source project, you want everyone on your team to know what open source is, know how open source works. There's an excellent um, ebook on producing OSS.com, and it's a free download. It explains everything you need to know about starting up an open source project. Uh, we found it very helpful with the Gateway Project to just go through it and uh, learn about the different processes that you need. Um, and it has a lot of tips about like what you need on your website if you have a project and all the little details. Um, and it helps if you have someone on your project team who is an open source contributor and is familiar with the community, is on mailing lists, uses open source software a lot. Uh, and you have to be prepared for skepticism and criticism when you're proposing such a project. And first, when you're deciding that you want to release some open source software, you need a good candidate project. Um, now, what makes a good candidate project? Um, it should run on an open source operating system like Linux. Um, if it's in a proprietary language like Visual Basic.net, that there's no compilers for Linux, it's not a good idea. Uh, most of the open source contributors use completely open source systems. Um, and generally, um, most licenses require that any of the libraries that your program depends on are also open source. So you have to take that into consideration as well. And you should also make sure it doesn't require any proprietary utilities or tools to build or develop. And it should be something that's generally useful to at least three people. Um, if you're writing a tool that converts from one data format to another and both data formats are internal formats that your agency created, then it's only useful to your agency and probably isn't the best option for making it open source. In the beginning, the Gateway Project started out as a closed source application. Um, we had been sort of mulling over the idea of releasing it as open source. And um, we st were using open source tools when we started the development. Um, we were using Eclipse. It's a free integrated development environment. We were running it on Debian and MySQL. And we were using a lot of open source libraries. Um, so um, when we did make the decision to release it as open source, uh, we didn't have to do a lot. And it made a good candidate project because 17 other states were implementing the same sort of streamlined sales tax web service that we were. Um, you can go out and just release the code on your own if you want, but it's probably best to get management's approval before you do it. <laughs> um, because the Gateway Project involves like our core business, it involves taxes, um, we decided to, that we really had to get management's approval, otherwise we could get in some trouble. So we ended up having to go like all the way up to the CIO for the state of Vermont, and we got everyone's approval along the way, and he was on board with it. Um, and the other option is to just go ahead and release the code. Um, it's probably best for like patches. It doesn't make sense to go out and get approval if you make a patch that 
helps other people, it's probably just a good idea to just share it. Uh, and now we made arguments for the Gateway Project. Um, the number one argument was cost. Uh, there are 17 other states doing it, and we wanted them to do our work for us and help us with some of the code. And we could help them with some of their code, and that would save some money for everyone involved. Um, and also, it doesn't cost us anything to release the code on um, SourceForge. SourceForge is a website. It's at sourceforge.net. And it gives you all the tools you need to develop an open source project. There's website space you can host your project on. There's a bug tracker, feature request system. Um, you name it, it's there. And it's all free. And um, going open source wouldn't really change much of the way we developed the code, other than it would just be out there for the public to download. And we did it to be a good neighbor, again, because the other states were doing the same thing. And um, I think there needs to be more collaboration in government, because everybody is repeatedly, repeatedly implementing the same things over and over again. Um, and we also made the point that students in Vermont who are studying Java development um, could look at our work and see a full program. Um, generally, like university students only see like little bits and pieces when they're doing assignments. Usually they're just a few hundred lines of code. Um, sometimes semester-long projects are bigger. Um, but this is like a full enterprise system that um, someone in the real world would use. And we think it uh, leads to better software instead of just having the Vermont Department of Taxes looking at the code and using the code. Um, we have that group plus the group of other states. And the other states um, provide more eyeballs. And there's a quote that um, as the number of eyeballs looking at the code increases, the bugs become shallow. So if you have a lot of um, skilled people looking at the source code and using the software, you can identify bugs faster and fix them faster. Uh, one question that uh, came up a lot, and it was pretty much the only source of resistance, was security concerns. Um, you have this tax system with tax data on it, and it's exposed to the internet, and people have the source code to how it all works. And that can be a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. It helps you, like someone could help you fix the problem or they can exploit it. Um, but in general, in my opinion, I think that um, neither closed source or open source is more secure or less secure. It all depends on the programmer and the technologies that they're using. Um, and you should always code with security in mind. And if you have something exposed to the public, you should think about what kind of data is on the server and what they can access. And you should evaluate closely the risks involved. Um, for us, we have this streamlined sales tax web service on a separate server um, outside of our firewall. And it just has the tax data for um, the sales tax returns. And um, that we thought that that was an acceptable risk. Um, we probably wouldn't have done it if we had to have all the tax databases connected to this one system. Uh, we can accept going out to the different vendors and saying, oh, your data was compromised, but we can't accept going out to every person in the state of Vermont who's ever filed a tax return and say, oh, we gave away all your private information, sorry. Um, and when you're starting an open source project, you should come up with a security disclosure policy. If someone does find a security bug in it, what are you going to do? Um, and there's a few different levels of how much information you want to release to the public about the security problems. Um, I'll start from the bottom up. Uh, there's silent fix. Um, you can just um, release a new version of the code and don't mention any security problems and just say, everybody upgrade. Um, it's good for you because you um, don't look bad and people don't know that there was a security problem with your software. 
On the other hand, if people don't upgrade, it exposes them to a lot of risk. Um, there's also limited disclosure. You can come out and say, oh, there's a security problem in our software, upgrade to this version. Um, it lets people know there's a problem and that it's urgent that they upgrade, but it doesn't give away the secrets to the hackers of what exactly is wrong with the software and how they could take advantage of that. Um, there's staggered disclosure. So if you are working with other state agencies that are using software like this, you tell the other state agencies first and make sure they're all patched to the latest level of the software. And then you re release to the public and say, oh, there was a problem, but it's fixed now. Um, there's full disclosure with patch. You can explain the problem, um, but you wait to hold off. You hold off on telling everybody until you have a patch to fix the problem. And then there's full disclosure where you detail exactly what was wrong, um, even if you don't have a patch yet to fix it. Uh, and then there's the big question about choosing a license. Uh, the Open Source, Source Initiative and the Free Software Foundation both have lists of licenses. Um, I suggest that you read them all, or at least read the most popular ones. Uh, and as you're reading them, try to figure out what you want the license to do for you. Um, there's a term called copyleft. Um, and basically, like with a BSD license, someone could take the code and incorporate it into a proprietary software application. And with something like the GPL that is copyleft, um, they can't do that. If they modify the code and release a new program, they have to also release the changes to that. Uh, some licenses require um, what are called notice files or advertisements, or like an advertising clause. And so you could specify, oh, the software is written by the state of Vermont. And anyone using the software would have to include this software is written by the state of Vermont in their advertising material. And the GNU General Public License um, is a pretty popular one. Um, but it's not compatible with some other open source licenses. Um, so one of the things you might want to think about is, is it compatible or not? Um, and the compatibility list is on the Free Software Foundation website. Um, another recommendation is look at what the other software in that area uses. Um, for example, a lot of the Java code is under the Apache 2 license. Um, a lot of C system libraries are under the LGPL. A lot of C programs are under the GPL. Um, and you shouldn't uh, create your own license, you shouldn't make this Vermont Department of Taxes software license. Um, there are already a lot of licenses out there and we don't really need any more. Um, and for 99% of the things you want the license to do, one already exists. And don't start a war over licenses. Um, there could, you could make the whole license choice process last weeks. Um, just sort of pick one that everyone's comfortable with and agrees on. Um, and for the copyright information, it's important to get it right. Um, and to find the exact text of the copyright, you can either ask someone in your legal department. A lot of times it's on your um, agency's website. Um, and then there's also the decision of requiring contributors to assign copyright or not. Um, you might want them to assign copyright so that later you can um, change the license of the code or protect it legally. Um, and you may also want to consider requiring contributors to sign um, a written statement saying that their, contributor, their contribution is from themselves and that it's legal for them to contribute it. Uh, and then there's the choice of development models. How are you going to let outside contributors contribute patches? Um, there are a lot of different um, ways open source projects operate. Um, some of them just have a core team that sort of decides the direction of the project. Uh, oops. Uh, others are, have more autonomous independent committers who commit changes and contributors will send the changes to the 
committers who will add them to the source repository. Um, some, th some projects like the Apache project has um, a voting system. So on their email list, when they want to release a new version of a software package, um, they'll have a vote and the developers decide if it's ready to be released or not. You can also have what's called a benevolent dictator. This is how the Linux kernel works. Linus Torvalds is in charge of letting each patch in or not. Um, or you can mix and match those and define your own method. But the key thing to remember is to document how someone will submit a patch or contribute something to your project. You want to enable participation as much as possible. When you're preparing your source code to be released to the public, it's important to have the developers read it over. Uh, make sure that the copyright header is there in every file, and make sure the code looks good, there's no indentation problems or swearing in the comments. Uh, but it's especially important to make sure there are no hard-coded passwords or names of the computers uh, or IP addresses or anything that you don't want public. Uh, and there's a version control system called Subversion and it lets you pull in, uh, like and it has a repository of all your source code. And it lets you, um, every, all of your developers commit code to the repository and it lets them work on the same files without colliding with each other and it lets them all keep up to date with every change that goes in. And it has a nice feature called SVN externals. And so if you have those private configuration files or password files, you can have your publicly hosted code and then um, have a private repository where you pull in the information that you want to keep private. Um, for the Vermont Department of Taxes in the Gateway Project, um, for the web interface, we have logos that say State of Vermont, and it says Official Vermont Government Website, and it says some other things, and we don't want just anybody on the inter internet pulling down those things and setting up a fake Vermont Department of Taxes server. Um, so what we do is we have a mock state and we have that in the public repository and we have like a different color scheme and different logos and stuff and we use that feature and it lets us keep all our Vermont layouts and designs private but it still keep everything else public so people can use our software. Um, version numbering, uh, when you're creating a project you'll have multiple releases and you need to come up with a version numbering system. And a lot exist. Um, for UDEV, they just keep incrementing the number. So there it's UDEV 115, and the next version will be 116. Um, the version system we use is with a major number and a minor number. When we have a lot of changes, we increment the major number. And we just have like small fixes, we increment the minor number. So if we made a major change, to 3.0, we would call it 4.0. And if we had a patch for that, it'd be 4.1. Linux uses a different scheme. Um, the exact method you choose doesn't really matter. What's more important is that you define what your method will be and mark the different um, releases that you have so that someone coming to your website knows is this version the stable version? Is it the development version? Which is the newest version? And you have to have documentation with um, your project. Uh, I know some of this stuff may seem really obvious that you need documentation explaining what your program is and what it does and sort of how to compile it and run it. But a lot of projects don't do this right and don't have the documentation that you need to get the program running. So these things are really important. And if you have screenshots or like examples, explaining, walking the person through how to do something, especially with commands they can copy and paste, it enables the user to use the software and potentially contribute later on to your code. And you definitely need a website. Um, it, 
you won't get any contributors if you just put your code up on an FTP site and hope someone finds it. Um, you need to have a website that includes all the documentation, uh, some answers to common questions that you think they might have. Um, you need a download page, um, some news to tell people what's happening, and sort of like a status so that people know what features are coming and what they can expect in new versions. Um, and there's some other services you can have. A lot of open source projects use Internet Relay Chat. Um, it works really well for them. I'm not sure it would work so well in state government. Um, someone on the outside looking in says, oh, all these state employees are just sitting around chatting all day. It probably wouldn't look that great. Um, but if you're interested in setting up a chat room, there's freenode.net for more information. Uh, mailing lists are a good way to communicate, especially with um, people that are geographically distant. Um, it makes it a lot easier to get information out to a lot of people than just a conference call or a phone call. And it's important to have an archive of all the mailing lists so that if someone runs into a problem, they can check to see if someone's already run into it before. Um, there's source control. Uh, I touched on it earlier with subversion. Um, but having a central place where all the source code is is important so that um, people can stay up to date with every th all the changes that are happening to the source code. Um, you can have a wiki. Um, we were thinking about this, um, but you have to be very careful that it isn't interpreted as the official word of the state. Um, it depends where you have it hosted. If you have it on like a .gov domain, um, you should be careful because spammers like to target those sites. Uh, preparing for the first release, um, basically make sure your, all your code and documentation is at the latest level and um, try testing it out. Make sure the package you made works. Um, you should release the full source code that's needed to build and run the project. Um, you shouldn't leave anything out. Um, and it should be in a standard format for the platform you're targeting. At Windows, usually everything's .zip. With Linux, it's .targz or .targbzip2. Uh, and write a press release. Let other people know about the project. And uh, when we made a press release for the Gateway, we distributed it to all the other tax departments in the area that we knew about that were doing streamlined sales tax. Um, we submitted it to um, a lot of open source PR sites. Um, and someone from the Chinese Linux University website included our press release. And that was kind of neat. It's all in Chinese. And I have a screenshot on the screen. Um, and now, finally, once you have everything ready to go, you need a place to host the project. Uh, and we, when we were making the Gateway project, we evaluated a few different options. You can go with the current department website. Um, usually, those are a lot less flexible than they need to be. Um, for the tax department website, if you want to change a sentence, you need to go through a whole approval process and submit it to the webmaster. And then they have to get around to changing it. And in the open source world, things happen really fast. And you make a change in a program, you also want to update the documentation right away. Um, so that wasn't too flexible for us. Um, and then we thought, OK, we can just set up our own server and install web server software and a bug tracker and all the other things we need. Um, but that takes a lot of time, and you have to buy hardware and have someone maintain it. And yeah, we just didn't have enough time to go through with all of that. And so the easiest thing we found was a canned hosting solution. Um, it's sort of like SourceForge. They provide everything you need to get a project up and running. And it's all free, and they take care of all the maintenance and everything on the back end. And then there's also like a custom hosting solution. Um, and they can be a lot more flexible, but it's a lot harder to find them. Um, and I'll explain each one in a minute. Um, for the canned hosting, here are some of the more popular um, services. 
There's SourceForge.net. And then the Free Software Foundation runs a project called Savannah, savannah.nongenu.org. And the Free Software Foundation in Europe, uh, I think they're connected with gna.org. And then there's also another site, berlios.de, that's based in Germany. And on Wikipedia, there's an article uh, outlining all the other options out there, and it gives like a comparison of what services they offer. Uh, you can go with a custom hosting solution uh, for the Gateway project. We did that for part of it. Uh, we wanted to have a demo site, um, but that requires a Java application server, and SourceForge didn't offer that. Um, so we contacted the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, and they provided us with a little virtual machine that lets us run our project. Um, and yeah, that was really nice of them to do that for free. Um, also, universities with open source friendly administrators sometimes will host stuff for open source projects for you for free. Um, also, at Linux users groups, you should be able to find someone who has a Linux box and a network connection who can provide um, some services for you. And when your government agency is producing open source software, it's good that they're a good community member. Um, in this, when they're using open source tools or libraries, um, they should, as much as they can, try to report bugs and fix them if they know how. Um, for the Gateway Project, we've submitted some patches to um, the Apache Foundation for a few of their projects, Apache Continuum and Maven. It's a build tool that we use. Try to have your developers join mailing lists for related projects. Um, it's a really, really useful. I highly recommend it. Um, you can help other people with the problems that you've had. Um, a lot of times, um, the same things will come up over and over again on a mailing list. Um, on the Maven mailing list, um, getting Eclipse working with Maven comes up time and time again. And we help some people on that list. Um, and you can also ask people for help, too, with problems that you're having. Um, and another thing is to develop in the open. Um, have all of your stuff public. Each change you make, have it be public. Have all your tickets public so that people can um, help you out with the problems that you're having and so they can look at the new feature requests. And try to acknowledge each contributor when they contribute something. Uh, usually in the change log or commit log, you can say, oh, thank this person for their wonderful work uh, adding this patch. Um, and yeah, a lot of open source developers um, develop um, for free. And so the only payment they get is a thank you. So it's important to thank them. Uh, and you should implement an open standard whenever possible in your code uh, so that you can interoperate with other applications. And a standard exists for just about everything. Um, we were storing translation data so that um, our web application could be available in English and French. And there's an XML format defined by a standards body for storing that data. So we implemented that standard. Um, and it's really useful because tools already exist for editing those kinds of files. So someone um, who's good at translations could just open up a translation program and start adding translations for us. And, if, and there's all sorts of standards bodies that define standards. And you should only implement open standards and in this context, open standards means ones that you can implement without having to pay any license fees or patents. And um, that in the standards are freely redistributable to anybody who wants to view them. And when you're implementing a standard, you should always implement the full standard, not just the part that you need to get your project done. Um, that lets other uh, 
applications generate data for you, and it helps with interoperability. Um, you know, donating to open source projects, um, a lot of projects need funding, but it's really hard for them, for state government agencies to f fund open source projects that aren't directly, directly related to the state. Um, for example, it, it's hard to get funding to pay for something that's free. Um, and all of the software we use to develop the gateway doesn't cost us anything. Um, so one thing we do is we encourage the developers of the project to contribute um, money to the different organizations out there that um, create software that we use. Um, for example, the Free Software Foundation has an associate member program. Um, the money goes to help fund the different projects and campaigns they do. Um, they make most of the software that's included with Linux. They make the compilers and a lot of the libraries. Um, so it's really important to contribute to them. Um, the Oregon State University has a really unique program called the Rackathon. And um, you donate money, and they put your name on a piece of paper, and they tape it to one of their server racks. And they take a little picture for the website. Um, SourceForge has a subscription program where you can get um, priority downloading and um, a lot of other little enhanced features that aren't available to normal, uh, normal users of the system. And a lot of projects have like a little donate button or like a PayPal link and people can donate directly. Um, and now I'm going to talk about some impressions and surprises that we had um, when doing the Gateway project. It was easier than expected to get management to agree to let us do this. We sort of said, oh, we want to share this code with other states and sort of let them help us with the development work. And that was pretty easy to have it go through. Uh, but it's harder than expected to get other states interested in collaborating with us and get them involved with the project. Uh, so far, we haven't gotten a single patch or a bug report or a feature request or a mailing list message from someone outside the tax department. Uh, sort of sad, but it's true. Uh, but we have gotten um, an inquiry about um, another state wanting to help us with part of the project. So things are looking up. I'm just hoping that people start changing their opinions sometime. But we have had some vendors using some of the tools we've created, and I'm going to give a demo of that in a minute. We did get a lot of encouragement from the open source community and the tax community. Um, there's a tax newsletter that goes out to all the state agencies once a week. It's called Tax Express. And one of the weeks, we were the cool idea of the week. And a lot of people from the open source community um, are praising the stuff that we've done. Uh, one sort of side effect is of everything being done out in the open is that um, employees can work from home. Um, they just need to be able to connect to SourceForge, and so they don't need any VPN access to do development from home. Um, and another sort of thing we came across was that a lot of the libraries we were using didn't have uh, enough documentation to do what we wanted to do. Uh, but luckily, them being open source, we could sort of look at how the library was implemented and then sort of reverse engineer of how we were supposed to use it. Okay, now I'm going to give a demo. And I have the application running on um, my laptop. Um, and you'll notice that it's XYZ ZY Department of Taxes. Um, that's the sort of mock state I was talking about earlier. And um, we have this login system. And like there's a section for administrators to manage users, and they can add and remove roles for the various users. Um, you can check on transmissions that have come in um, from different transmitters, and so. I'll show you this. Like um, we had one come in in September, and we can view the data for that. 
and it's all in XML. And now I'm going to show you some of the client tools we wrote as well. This is one of the tools we wrote for one of the vendors because they're having trouble submitting valid data for us. So um, we made it so that they can send data to our web service through this tool. Um, and um, for example, they could transmit data. This is a test send we used for debugging a lot of things. Um, and we can take these transmissions and we have a little validator that we wrote and um, this is what the vendors really like. You can just click on the validate document and it tells you, oh, it's invalid. Um, let me, okay, so it says it's valid and then if we change something that makes it invalid, it'll highlight the line and say, the day value is invalid. Um, and and that's the uh, project website again, um, the gateway demo site. Um, if you want to try out our software and um, see more about it, it's hosted at the open source lab at OSU. And there's the Vermont Department of Taxes website at the bottom. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments? Yes. So, what um, open source lic license did you select, and what, why wouldn't one license it? Uh, I know you mentioned libraries and a, a lot of considerations, but why wouldn't there be one good open source license for governments to use to release? Uh, uh, for the Gateway project, we chose the Mozilla public license. Um, at the time, we wanted to use a lot of pro uh, libraries from the Apache project, and those are all licensed under the Apache license. And uh, we were thinking about the GNU general public license, but at the time, only version 2 was out, and that isn't compatible with the Apache license. So we had to sort of make a compromise. Uh, but some of the other, like during the course of things, we've created sort of spin-off projects. Um, for this new modernized e-file thing we're working on, uh, people will be sending us files attached. Um, so we need to scan them for viruses um, because people will be looking at the files um, on Windows computers. And so we created a um, sort of this antivirus software that plugs into Clam AV, and um, we released that under the GNU General Public License. Why did you choose the GPL? What was the thought uh, process to choose GPL? Um, because Clam AV is under the GPL, and we wanted to link against it. Yes. When you were doing your license considerations, was that all self-researched, or were you using like services like Black Duck or Palomita, which does that kind of compatibility research? Uh, uh, we did just did our own research. Uh, yes. Any thoughts in? So you said it's all Vermont people now participating. Right. Any thoughts on why the other states are? Um, a lot of the other states are .NET states, and so they would have to hire Java developers to um, really take advantage of our software because each state has their own uh, processing system for like um, doing direct debit and different things, and so there would be some custom coding involved. When we implemented it, we tried to make it as modular as possible, so a state would just have to implement the processor part. Um, and another 
issue with other states not wanting to join in was that a lot of the other states had already started their projects or hired contractors by the time we open sourced our system. Did you see how in the future other states will start to participate? Um, yeah, I. I, I'm hoping that other states participate. I think they will. Um, uh, we've implemented streamlined sales tax, and so far there's only about like 15 to 17 other states that have implemented it, and there will be more states joining in the future, and so that they will be looking t for um, an implementation or a vendor to provide them with streamlined sales tax software. So I'm hoping that other states will do that. We're also working on modernized e-file, and we're creating sort of like a mock e-file server. Each of the states connects to the IRS through web services, and so we're making sort of our own IRS so that we can do testing with that, and we're hoping at least other states will use that when they're testing their software. In the back. You spoke about how it was necessary to escalate some of the, some of the decisions about whether you would do this and how you would do this up to who, the, the head of MIS in your state. But my question is, uh, with regard to state implementations, is how much do you have to take consideration of the legislature, which is your ultimate decision authority? I'm not 100% sure. Um, we just kept going up the food chain and asking if we could do it, and then that's where the buck stopped. Anybody else here with state governments who have problems with their legislators? Certain, some legis. I'm from Washington State, and as you might imagine, we have a, a very large, powerful software organization that, that <laughs> likes to occasionally work through legislatures at different levels of government, all the way up to the federal level, and um, it can be a problem. Any of you have legislative problems or legislative issues? What do you do about it? I spend a lot of time talking with legislative aides. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I'm not sure how this remains, but I've tried to use some open source software from the corrections. And the problem that we've encountered in trying to use open source software is that even though it's it's open and we've tried to make it as non-state specific as possible, you, you keep stumbling into the originating states like in your case would be the tax code structure. And if your tax code structure and New Hampshire's tax code structure aren't exactly the same, how much do they have to go through and sort out the structure and re-implement to be able to use what you've done? Uh, well, for the thing that we've done, um, the initial project was this Dreamline sales tax project. And to be a member of that project, each state has to um, change their tax system to be, well, streamlined. Um, for example, in Vermont, we didn't have any taxes on beer, and now that's taxed. Um, and so some legislative changes were made in each state to make everything work the right way. Um, ah, OK. So it, to, to, to build the basis Everybody had to agree on a tax structure. Right. Um, and for the modernized e-file project, um, there's a standards body called the Tigers Group. And they define schemas and web services for uh, tax systems. And each state is going to have like their own individual schema and like list of data that they need. And then there's going to be some common data at the beginning, so like the name and address will be the same, but then each state will say what data it needs, and when it requests the data from the IRS, it'll get the data for that state. Just after that, real quick, can based on the keynote, can you talk about how 
always how you build the stack. So like a stand, you have to have a standard for it really to be used in multiple areas. It shows up over and over again. Global proactive and unique. Uh, global proactive and unique. Uh, Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I may have messed this up at the uh, How did you convince your management that spending resources to develop open source was better than going out and getting someone to contract it or getting something that was, uh, I got good cost for this, but how did you get that decision up there? How did you convince them that spending your resources developing this was better than going out and having a contractor do it? Um, well, the project was already approved to be developed in-house, and so um, we suggested, why don't we share it? It doesn't cost us anything extra to put it out there, and so maybe we could get some help, and if not, then it's just development as usual. Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>